Clyde Golden. I'm Tim Yaden, and this is Input Doc. It's the podcast where we explore what marketers need and what agencies provide. Hey, Ryan. Hey there. How's it going? Good. Nice to see you. Nice to talk to you. Nice to see you. Looking forward to chatting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I wanted to check in with you anyways and see how life was going, but this is a great opportunity yeah. too. <laughs> Hey, how are you? I've been, I was listening to a couple of um, episodes. They're terrific, right? Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Which ones did you catch? Just curious. I, I caught a little bit of um, the two girls in their studio, the one year in, the yes. most recent one. Yeah. And I had a listen to the guy who was the um, kind of personality brand development type person. Yeah, the, the YouTuber. Finn. The YouTuber. Yeah, the um, – yeah. The MBA, what was he? Punk rock. Oh yeah, MBA. the punk rock MBA. MBA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think he's been a hustler for a long time, and he sort of carved out this niche, and it's really interesting, you know, how he's monetizing it. Very foreign to what I do, actually. And maybe, you know, just like the type of things that we work on. And so it was really interesting to hear about that. If you want to double check, is your mic actually plugged in? Ah, uh, we go. That actually snapped up quite a bit, much livelier. A bit better? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we sound great. <laughs> Come yeah. on. We could do this. Yeah. We should travel the world via Zoom interviewing people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's a career path now. Yeah, absolutely. Just... Zoom MC is a career path. <laughs> what is it? The Zoom MC. The Zoom MC. Yeah. I had a Zoom MC for my birthday. How was it? It kind of rally everybody together. Uh -huh. and nobody's talking over one another. Everybody gets uh -huh. a go. We had a little bit of Ryan trivia. What do you know about Ryan? Oh, you know, fascinating. This. Yeah, it was fascinating. Yes. Uh -huh. It's sort of not really a hype man, but just sort of crowd control for a Zoom party. Exactly. <laughs> With a little bit of hype man. Because <laughs> I, I would want a hype man, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a short intro that I'm going to read. Okay. So Ryan... Ryan Smith lives in Melbourne, Australia, where he's an award-winning designer and owner of Freewell Weekends, a digital experience agency specializing in accessibility. Ryan says countries around the world are losing billions of dollars in tourist revenue each year from people just like himself, those with reduced mobility, and it's simply a lack of communication that could help people with reduced mobility plan a trip of confidence. How well did I describe that? That was pretty good. That was pretty good. You could be my hype man. You could be my intro guy. Are you, are you available? I am available, actually. <laughs> well, welcome to Input Talk. Pleasure to be chatting with you. Tim. Well, it's been a few years since we've chatted. And um, so you currently own the only agency of its type in the world, from what it sounds like. I think that's fair to say, actually. Yeah. Um, and I, I noticed that because... In, in every other kind of facet of my design career, it's been helpful to look at competitors and to say, okay, what are these guys doing and how are they doing it? But it's, it's pretty difficult with, uh, free wheel weekends at the moment because it, it really is a very specialized niche. And, and as you said, it, it's about, um, helping destinations communicate their accessibility. It's about customer experience for people with reduced mobility. Um, and there's a lot of, a lot of talk and a lot of people out there that are advising on access. So they're telling you how to make a ramp or how to make your toilet bigger, which is, which is fantastic. You know, and this is, this is what the world needs and certainly what tourism needs. Um, my role is not to do that. My role is to, is to set the expectations of your visitors who have a mobility issue. So the last thing we want, and, and I'm in, in a wheelchair, uh, as people with reduced mobility is kind of those nasty surprises. And I can tell you some horror stories, which, uh, uh, which, are, which, are, you know, there's quite a few of them. And, and my community sort of has a, a, a swathe of these, of these, uh, stories about how they booked an Airbnb and somebody said it was accessible and it's not. And sure, there's a, there's room for, for access and consultation and all of this, but. I'm a, I'm a designer. I want to make beautiful things. I want to communicate. That's kind of in my DNA. So my job is about setting expectations and using um, accessibility as almost as a competitive advantage. Yeah. So what are a few basic things that companies around the world could be doing 
to market to people with reduced mobility? Well, I think the first thing to look at would be to say, well, why do it in the first place? Um, which is a fair point because it, you know, in some cases it's not an inexpensive exercise. It involves those things that I mentioned. It, it does involve maybe building a ramp or, or making a bigger toilet. Um, so it is, it, it can be a, a bit of an outlay, but it needs to be communicated. At the moment, there's this kind of like this deafening silence. It often, if you go to, as a, as a person with a reduced mobility, if you go to a, a hotel booking site, you won't see the accessible rooms listed. Now, uh, I've asked a few people why this is, and we, we're not really getting a consensus on that. Sometimes it, it, the feedback is, well, the hotels don't want to kind of get this wrong. Um, it, maybe it's accessible, but it's not, but it's not compliant. So there's all sorts of, you know, conflicts between what's right for the customer versus what's legally required. And also, um, they don't think in a lot of cases they have a lot of rooms and therefore they just, they kind of would prefer if people called up and they could consult um, one on one, which is in some ways a good thing. That's, that's what I end up doing. Is it more of a question of the hotel doesn't feel like the room is perfect when it comes to accessibility and therefore let's not, let's not market it as such Ver- yeah. versus, versus like, so I looked around your website and I've watched a bunch of your videos. It just simply seems to be that if you can shed light on the situation of anywhere that somebody's going to go, they get a fighting chance to plan their trip and decide whether they want to go do it or not. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the world is not a, not a worse place. If you have people with reduced mobility, you know, getting out and about and visiting, um, visiting highlights and, and attractions around the world. We, we only get better as a society by doing this. Um, which is part of the, the, the story I, I tell to, to people who are thinking about talking about their accessibility it could be a caravan park it could be a, a hotel turn could be could be anyone um and and sometimes not necessarily tourist destinations but, but primarily nobody loses if you put a ramp in instead of a set of stairs it, that opens it up that doesn't close it down um so there is a there is a big benefit by doing that but also there's there's an economic benefit um it makes financial sense um in the u.s alone um, it's worth seventeen billion dollars, and that was that was three or four years ago now. The accessible travel market, so it's certainly a, a lucrative space to be working in. Um, one in four people have a disability. Obviously, not all of those people have mobility issues. There's varying types of disabilities as well, as well you know. So it just makes sense. Like it's it's an inclusive um, approach to tourism, and it it makes financial sense as well. So. Uh, I think we're evolving. I think if an, if an old man like me can use the word woke, I think we're getting closer to woke. So, you know, I, I, I feel like it's, it's time. You know, we met five or six years ago and you're a creative director in Australia and uh, we work for the same company, the Oracle Marketing Cloud. I don't know if we'd both been acquired in against our will to yeah. work for the Oracle Marketing <laughs> Cloud, uh, but you know, it's, it was still an interesting job. And then I was in Seattle. And so. You had a massive territory, Australia, New Zealand, I'm guessing Japan also? Yeah, yeah, we in Japan, um, yeah, that whole, whole region, New Zealand, APAC, yeah. And in the end, I had probably everything from Hawaii to Denver also, you know, but, <laughs> but from a laptop in Seattle, <laughs> roughly. Yeah. And you yeah. had already traveled all around the world, and I remember sitting down with you several times and just asking about some of your experiences, and I remember asking, you know, what's it like to be in a chair in Seattle and get around and how easy is it? Or, you know, and you were actually like, Seattle is, is a breeze. I can go anywhere I want. It's not an issue. And yeah. I would, I'd be interested about, interested in hearing how you got from there to owning free will weekends. And was there like, you know, was there a moment of outrage? Was there a moment of clarity that said, actually, I'm going to focus on this? It's, that's a really good question. And I think that evolution story is, is, it's a bit of a trope, I have to say. I'm sorry, but it's it's um it's being uh, disenchanted with with my role a little bit in the world of design and marketing and communications, and and just sort of deciding to step back a little bit and take some time uh, to sort of reestablish my kind of values or remind myself what I who I was, and where I wanted to sort of be. Um, yeah, and so I I took a year off, and in that year, 
uh, after being a, a designer and a creative director and a team leader and a, a design specialist since I graduated from university back in the, um, in the nineties to sort of step back and go, okay, well, life is a, is a little bit bigger than this thing. Um, let's just pause for a minute and see what's, what's going on and see what kind of see what bubbles up more than anything. Um, and in that time, I, I spent a bit of time, uh, trialing different, I suppose you would call them experiences, although that word's been sort of polluted. And what I'm trying to say was I saw a whole lot of opportunities on Facebook for uh, days out to, to come and try. I think they call them come and try days. So I, I went out and I tried uh, wheelchair ice hockey. I went out and I tried rock climbing. I tried wheelchair sailing or parasailing, as it's known. So basically there was an opportunity to – experience all of these different sports and activities, things that I'd never done before. And I'm much more at home in uh, in a gallery or a museum than I am than I am on a sports ground or, or mm-hmm. doing anything sporty. So I was outside my comfort zone and it was it was kind of fun. It mixed results, varied results. Some of the activities I didn't didn't really tickle my fancy. Other ones I, I really enjoyed and, and took up um and it was just a really good chance to try all these different things. And I, I, it can't, I came to realize that there is so much on offer if you do have reduced mobility that people need to know about this. And, and really, here's a chance to sort of document my experience and maybe encourage some people to, to get out and try these things. Because I do, I do know and I did know that the rate of anxiety and depression amongst people with reduced mobility is a lot, a lot higher than it is for the general population. And so a little bit of a nudge or a little bit of a story can't hurt if it, if you put that out there into the world and hopefully some, some people will get out and try these these things. Uh, and so I started documenting that as, and that was the kind of the birthplace of, of Free Will Weekends. And the videos are really charming. Like the writing's good, the VO's good, there's a nice tone, narrative cut is great. Not that you need to oh, do think- these things. <laughs> but when I watch them, I'm like, these are great, and I want to go to these places and take a look around. And- <laughs> I, th- I think you're being overly generous there, mate. I I feel in some ways the videos. I feel like a busker. You know, I'm practicing in public. Honestly, yeah. I'm 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 kind of throwing things in. I'm experimenting. Um, my equipment is is kind of getting better, and I've made a you know investment into that uh, since the my most recent trips, and so. You know, it, it's like I've got a better guitar now. I'm right. doing some smaller gigs. I'm no longer on the street, uh-huh. and actually, and actually, I've um, I kind of been discovered a little bit. So yeah. I'm about to make a big release. I, I don't want to kind of talk too much about it, but mm-hmm. yeah, I, there's a, there's an opportunity coming up which I'm working on, which I'm really excited about, and it's gonna um, it's gonna bring a lot more prominence to those those stories. So yeah, it's been it's been difficult as a person, and, and maybe you can relate to this as a designer. You you iterate, but you iterate in your own way, and it's not certainly not in public, um, particularly with visual design as opposed to usability. Usability practicing in public is, is part of the process, but with with a visual design, you you perfect things in your own time, and you bring your own nuanced, quiet sort of working methodology to it. Whereas if you're doing if you're busking, the mistakes are out there for everyone to see, and, and and eventually and ultimately you'll look back and go, "Oh, I can barely watch this now because it's awful." And which is a great sign, right? It means you've improved, you've improved, and you've got a a, a growing skill set, if you like. So, yeah, it's it's been interesting. I, you know, I had expected your content uh, to be about design and coding for accessibility. But then it was, in, but then it was content that helped people plan for trips. I mean, it was, it felt more Rick Steves than, you know, uh, accessibility for the web. Yeah, yeah. The idea is um, to only talk about the accessibility. So we went to the Egypt, uh, the pyramids in Egypt, the the Great Pyramids, and you know there are hundreds of thousands of videos about the history, you know, and about the experience and about being there and so on and so forth. That's all well and good. That's not what I'm on about. And if you want to find out that information, there are tons of places to find that out. If you want to know what the surface is like, if you want to know what it's like, if you have a mobility issue, or if you're traveling there as a wheelchair user, then my videos are for you. Oh, and you are moving quickly through places 
critiquing the ground surface, uh, the, the slope of a hill, uh, an entryway, how you got there, were there tracks in the way? And it's, and then describing coming up to a rough area in front of the pyramids. And next stop was a camel. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was, uh, I was kind of pretty much dragged up onto that camel <laughs> under duress, but, um, probably the highlight of, highlight of the trip. It would be the same for me as well. <laughs> <laughs> Those animals are crazy. They're big, right? I don't, I don't, I can't picture myself ever standing next to a camel. Maybe when I was a little kid or something at the Portland Zoo. I'm not sure. Put it on your list. It's, yeah. it's a good, it's a good thing to do. It's a good yeah. thing to do. Yeah. So we took that holiday as a holiday. So I, my intent was to take a few videos while we were there. It was never to really turn this into something that was as advanced as it is at the moment, or at least as, um, as much energy as I'm putting into it now. So it has, it has sort of really evolved there. And yeah, thanks for the kind words. They are as, uh, as pieces growing. But the idea I think is to, is to make something that's beautiful. And again, this comes back to marketing and, and design again, trying to bring those sensibilities into these pieces. And that is make something that's beautiful and, and interesting visually, but also has an element of, of utility to it. So something that has a function and, uh, and a, and a, a nice form, as it were. So they have these, these kind of dual purposes. And I really think that, um, disability awareness has a lot to do with representation. There aren't, uh, a lot of advertising agencies that, that like to use people with disabilities, even though, as I mentioned, they're, um, one in four people in, in your life will have some form of disability yet. In, within the media, you'd be forgiven for thinking they didn't exist at all. So there's definitely an imbalance there. And again, it, it's time for that to, to start reflecting reality a bit more. And I sometimes, I, I'm, my mind goes to an analogy of, a, of, a, of an accessible toilet, like a, a bathroom, if you like, with a, um, with a roll-in shower, beautiful slate, you know, lovely fittings and fixtures and features. You would never know that it was accessible. You would never know that it was absolutely spot on perfect from a functional point of view for a person with a, with a disability or the mobility issue because it was just designed really well. So as opposed to, let's say, a, uh, a, a bathroom in a hospital, for example, which is a clinical and wide and plastic and just really awful and bright. And I guess my point is we can really get those two elements of function and, and beauty to intertwine. They don't have to be um, separate. Into the most normal thing in the world. Yeah. 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 Just, pu- just pure normalization. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of agencies are focused on accessibility as far as how things are coded and can a screen reader, you know, track the way tables are set up or is the type uh, clear enough for somebody who doesn't see that well, you know? Um, so it is in that regard, we think a lot about it. It's the other piece of creating content that when I watch your videos, it's just so clear and simple is why the concept's great because these are just descriptions of areas that in turn shed light that would allow me to know if I was on crutches, could I get there? Or Hmm. I can decide ahead of time, is that the level of effort that I want to put out or I can do? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And, And look, one way or another, one way or another, it, it's all coming for us, right? That time in our life, that time in our lives when the food needs to be a little bit softer, we might right. not be able to walk as far as we used to. Yeah. Our memory and potentially our hearing is not great. You know, like uh-huh. it or not, it's on its way, right? It's yeah. in the post. So yeah. it's, it's sort of a, a way of kind of future proofing spaces as well. If, if this is taken into consideration. It's um, true. But yeah, it's look, true. coding and, and, and website design. Probably, arguably, more important, right? Um, this is a this is a space that everybody <laughs> everybody uses. So, you know, being able to use a screen reader, having um, alt text to dis- to describe images, um, not having junk code in there, yeah, it's it's super important. And there's lots of people out there in the um, in the disability space that are that are doing great things in in that area. Yeah, and, and I think it's it's really interesting the voices out there 
Um, it, as you know, as a, as a content creator, you, you, it's important to get cut through, but it's also important to have a sort of. I think it, I think it's crucial to have a warmth, have a have a welcoming um, tone. Um, I feel like there's a lot of uh, agitators in the disability space now. Maybe that's maybe that's not being fair. Maybe I'm spending too much time on Twitter, but some people have a lot of reasons to be to be angry. What do you mean an agitator? Well, I think there's a fine line between um, an activist and an advocate, and I think there are, there are voices out there that are unhappy about the situation and and with good reason, and they have a lot to say about a lot of people getting angry, a lot of people getting. Um, I don't know, vocally violent, some way, you know, at one end, and somewhere in the middle, there's there's kind of a discourse that is generally even in the middle ground. It, it's fairly heated. So the talk, talk of ableism, there's talk of um, discrimination, and don't get me wrong, this, these are really, really important topics, and I and I really feel like there's a, we have a long way to go. But I, I think from my point of view, I, I don't want to contribute to that i want to have a voice of agency and a voice of of positivity i was talking to somebody the other day about um inspo you know hashtag inspo and inspiration is it's kind of become a dirty word and i, w- I want to reclaim that i think inspiration is a beautiful thing inspiration is full of optimism and warmth and energy it's not about um, Botox and beaches and and selfies. You know, to me, it's about looking to the future and guiding oneself and and maybe one's community and and the rest of the world in a really wonderful direction that can be inclusive. And you know, it, it's it's really been polluted somewhat. So I want to inspire people and I want to be a positive voice. I don't want to add to that kind of. Um, downtrodden or or the fighting the fighting voice out there which i don't get me wrong is completely necessary and needed and has has created change don't get me wrong this is where we are today is is a, in a lot of ways the result of that voice but i think we're getting to the stage where um i feel at least my con- contribution sh- can be and is naturally a bit more um hopefully optimistic yeah, yeah. we all have to play to our own strengths you know hmm. i'm yeah, I'm not in the right spot if I'm the agitator, but I can watch and think, listen, and ask questions. Yeah, and I think that's key. And I think all of these voices need to be heard in order to spark those those thoughts and those connections. I even think just practicing asking these questions and talking about topics like this, super helpful to me as a person. I, some things I just, I do actually think, I build a lot of things in life, and I do think about, like I know... I know there are specific widths to doors in inside um, a building and an exterior door and certain slope that a ramp can be, et cetera. And so I'm always fascinated by that. And when I see something that I'm like, there's no way that works. But your idea is just storytelling. And that's what I love that was so powerful in the idea that I'm just going to go and I'm going to tell stories. It's almost like how Anthony Bourdain traveled the world and ate different types of food. And that sometimes would just be irritated. And you would think, this, this feels very normal. I like this. I could do yeah. this. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's time. Yeah. As, as I mentioned before, it's, it, it feels for, like it's, we're ready for it. For your agency, tell me about the service model that you see ahead. Yeah. So this is really interesting. And, and I, I wanted to talk about this and, and maybe ask you some questions actually, because this content in some ways is aimed at people with reduced mobility to help them so it's it's useful it's practical and it has real uh functional use but also in some ways it's a showcase for destinations to show what they can do you know with the right imagination they can apply that to their own business space experience activity whatever it may be and so i've got these two audiences as it were and i'm kind of trying to connect these two groups and wondering you're you're almost doing the, a, a similar thing in the fact that you're you're talking with um, designers, makers, creators, marketers about how they do their thing, but you're also using that as a way, I assume, to mm-hmm. talk to prospects and to showcase prospects how they can use their communication strategy strategy in the, to best reach their people. 
Mm-hmm. So how do, how do you feel about these kind of dual audiences? And do you feel as though that that model sort of fits with you, or am I sort of a little bit off track? There? I think you're in the neighborhood. Um, I, you know, I'm always curious why people decide to sell what they sell and how they got to where they're at, and um, and that's sort of how we run the business. And that we go in an ethnographic way. We'll go in and learn somebody's business, and we'll learn everything about them, and then we'll go out and talk to customers and do surveys and do interviews and from there come up with these stories that we think will resonate and so it's true that input doc is there's a few reasons why input doc exists um one i wanted to show our content creation strength and i looked at the team that we had and the skills that we had i had been a reporter i knew how to interview people um I had a uh, marketing manager who is an excellent producer and storyteller. Um, I have a designer who is also a great writer and he can do a bit of motion. I thought collectively, I think we can pull this off. And really, I'm just trying to show behind the curtain a bit and show the curiosity that drives this agency. In turn, you can see our ethos. And by describing the ethos, I think you'll get a sense of who we are and whether you see that, A, one reason I love checking in with you is... You know, I wanted to check in with you first off because we've sat and had beers numerous times and I'd like to see what's going on. But you're doing something that's fascinating. You've driven a stake into the ground and I want to know about that. And so if I can share stories like this of spots where people have niched or not niched or they're just doing something out of passion, then I want to know about it because everybody has a story, everybody has a methodology. So if you have a, um, a resort and there's some sort of ethos that they have an experience that you'll have and it won't be for everybody that experience won't be for everybody and nor will the grounds or the way that you would interact with it but if i could clearly explain what it is and what the opportunities are when you come here and leave it then you can make that decision and i feel like that that drives directly at at your agency's mission and I loved that because I was like, finally, somebody figured out how to do something clear. Because I always struggle with um, what industry should we chase? What types of companies? I really just want to be brought the riddle and I will solve the riddle and help them. Like, <laughs> I just want the riddle. Yeah. And isn't, and isn't that it's like something that's sort of hardwired in, in the creative brain is that, well, there's a few things to me. The curiosity, like a genuine fascination with people and stories and the way the world works it's it's just beautiful and it's lovely to hear these different perspectives on the world mm-hmm. and what drives people and how they work and why they do what they do how come they that's like that why why is that like that so that constant curiosity and questioning and and storytelling and and as you as you know this is your field but it's such a powerful powerful thing you know to be able to hear a story to be able to relay a story to have that that arc and the ebb and the flow and the color, the light and shade. Uh-huh. This is this is culture, but it's also communication. I mean, dare I say it? We're we're of the same uh, ilk and age. And when I went to design school, we didn't we didn't touch computers for eighteen months, and we were taught we were taught how to be communicators first and designers second. Right. We studied film. We did photography. We did printmaking. We, we all of this stuff to be able to communicate. And to be able to commu- communicate, you need to be able to relay a story. Um, and to relay somebody else's story requires that genuine interest and curiosity. So it, you know, I wouldn't be anywhere else. You know, yeah. What a what a incredible industry to be in. What a privilege. Uh huh. May everyone have our problems. That's how I always <laughs> yes, feel. <that's> right. <laughs> it's like I get to do this. This is great. I'm curious about the impact of COVID on accessibility. And I feel like, I mean, everybody's, everybody's struggling with how do we stay in business? How do we interact with the public? You know, for yourself, what are you seeing? Um, I'm going to answer that question by um, sort of reversing it a little bit. At the moment, I'm, uh, I'm running free wheel weekends and I have projects on and I'm building out um, awareness campaigns and I'm doing, you know, constant work on that. But also on the other hand, I have some, I, I don't want to say traditional design or marketing work, but it's, it's work that my agency undertakes as, as kind of the bread and butter, if you like, uh-huh. 
So mm-hmm. it's work that, that pays the rent, keeps the, keeps the lights on and keeps me working and keeps money you know, coming in. Um, and at the same time, I'm building up free will weekend. So it's a bit of a juggling act at the moment. It's a, the scales are sort of tipping towards free will weekends. And I think the entrepreneurs and the, the small business owners that I've spoken to that are at my stage of development are generally doing the same thing. Um, so in that respect, I'm, I'm, ba- I'm balancing the, these two workloads. So from, um, existing work from the agency that are, that's doing the branding and the communication work, that's, that's still coming in. Like there's not a lot of change around that. In fact, I'm doing some work out of, um, uh, Michigan at the moment, um, some branding work there. So, um, that is an ongoing project evolving, which is great. Um, and so that hasn't really been affected so much by COVID. Certainly, on the other hand, the free will weekends work has significantly been affected by by COVID. The travel restrictions we have here in in Victoria have been some of the toughest on the planet. We've gone into complete lockdown. We've had curfews. We've had a state of emergency declared. We um, we had some some real stringent restrictions come in place. Now we're we're flowing out of that. We're you know we're stepping down, if you like. So we're we're finally just in time for for spring and summer coming out of some of those harsh restrictions. But in the meantime, you know I've got a, a significant project that I was supposed to be running through July, uh, which was supposed to be wrapped up by November, which just I haven't been able to do at all. I haven't been able to to get outside the house. Um, for any length of time, let alone work and, and film. So yeah, it's, it's had a, it's had a crushing effect on the tourism industry and, and certainly on, on industry, any industry that involves being outside or amongst people. It's been devastating. Yeah. We've had to move. Well, we've actually gotten quite good at remote content and the use of stock, <laughs> but there's a hair and makeup person who sent me a note recently and had an interesting safety protocol of how she would work. And I thought that's interesting. And. You're seeing a lot of protocols, and I think that people are going to figure out they're going to do the best they can to be as safe as they can and work in the best way they can. You know, I I don't know how to put that gracefully. Except I think it's a risk at this point. But if you mask up and you keep some distance and you do a lot of outdoor shoots, you're probably okay. Yeah. And is it and isn't that reassuring when I say you're probably okay <laughs> with, my, with my medical background? I was going to say you. So you've done a, a streamlined online Zoom course in epidemiology. Is, is that <laughs> what's happened here, or right after this? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. but I think you're right. So it, it's going to be, and it already is, about protocols and process, and. Part of that is about communicating that pro- those protocols and that process. Um, in the early days, I was really fascinated by the little stickers and and signs that businesses were putting up. My my little area is a tiny little village, little shop fronts, and I would go along and I started taking photographs of how they were saying what their process and protocol was. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So some of it was really elegant and using these lovely sort of symbols and a really considered typeface. Other times it was you know scratched out with a sharpie and and you know, and everything in between. So, you know, people are getting a handle on this, and I think you know, uh, most people and most businesses are being pretty agile with it. They're uh, they're adapting. I think is is the, is the way to describe it. You're going to love that I have a I have a Google Drive photo or a folder full of the exact same photos, and my team <laughs> has been we we've considered going through and sort of jurying them and looking at. Who's clear? I mean, like, it's an onboarding process at the moment with a new product and a new service everywhere you go. And people have to figure out how they're going to interact with the public. And good signage is just brilliant. And poor signage that's confusing is, you know, I mean, there's certain things I'm still just not going to do. I'm not going to go in a pub and sit in the middle of a pub and, and have a beer with a bunch of other people. Um, but I go and get a haircut and I've been to the dentist. You know, and I think there's still a lot of things I can do. Um, yeah, I saw a note on your Instagram about as we open up, let's stay accessible. And I'm curious for people with reduced mobility, what what's the future forecast that you see? Or what? I, I'm just I'm a little bit concerned, particularly um, around Melbourne at the moment, around Victoria. We're coming into summer, so there's going to be a lot of uh, outdoor dining. We're going to have opening up the the 
the hospitality industry. So there's going to be cafes and restaurants. They are by law restricted to reduce their numbers of, of indoor diners. And therefore there's a big incentive at the moment. Some of it is being quite creatively thought out. Big incentive to have diners seated outdoors and have customers seated outdoors, which as we know is, is, is a great thing to do. It makes complete sense. Now, my concern is that am I going to be able to get down the street in my wheelchair if these if these diners are outside? How are we going to work that out from a spatial point of view? Uh, I've already seen some pictures on YouTube or sorry on on Instagram of um, disabled car spaces that have been commandeered as 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 eating areas. So I just want to know how that's work how that works, and I just implore people. Uh, in councils and in businesses to to just keep that in mind, keep accessibility in mind, so well, there's not a a, a trade off that that um, that has one group suffering and uh, for another to to sort of flourish. Yeah, I think it's a solvable one, Tim. I think it I think it can be solved, and I think it, it just requires that lens, that that perspective. Yeah. Well, your work, your mission over time should shed light on that for people that, you know, creating things that are of interest to everybody that cover this, get you thinking about it. It plants a seed in the back of your mind. Yeah. And, and we're lucky, you know, we live in a, in a first world country where the, we, we have the, the latitude to consider these things and they're legislated. So for the most part, back to, you know, process and, and protocol, this should be part of the the thinking and the and the rationale behind the work because quite simply it's, it's part of the law mm-hmm. so well let's just just watch this space i think maybe there'll be a an instagram uh, hashtag that might um start to start to bubble up with all these uh accessibility atrocities yeah yeah you went through covid the pandemic over the winter and we we at least it happened in the spring and so this entire time we've been able to get outside, get some fresh air, and I don't know how cold it gets where you are. I think it's a, it's a similar weather here, roughly, isn't it? I think Seattle's a little, just a little bit colder. A little bit colder. By, by memory, but, but certainly we have the seasons, yeah. Yeah. So we've been, we're curious as winter approaches, like restaurants are going to have a really tough time if people are unwilling to go inside. We've got a lot of takeout pizza and it's been really good. And I've really enjoyed how some of the bars will package up our favorite drinks and give them to you in a jar and you can bring them on home and have them. Cause yeah, yeah, I'm not a mixologist, but I know that my wife would really like a fantastic Manhattan on, <laughs> on any given day. And I think that that's important for, important for, important for everybody's attitude. <laughs> yeah. We feel, we feel like, uh, it hasn't, you know, overly affected us so much, but certainly, because we had two phases. We had phase one and then we opened up for a short amount of time and then we locked back down again quite hard, uh, hard on the first time around. So it's been the first time was everyone, everyone was optimistic, I guess. And there was a sense of novelty about it. Everyone was saying, Oh, so yeah, I'm really, I'm learning Spanish now and I'm yeah. making my own bread. And yeah. this time around, everybody's going, just get me out of here. Yeah. Wrap it up. <laughs> yeah. There was one video I wanted to mention that I didn't get a chance to mention earlier. And um, you went to a place called Fongare. Mm. And as a great example for one of the adventures that you went on, and I'd like to hear about several of the adventures that you've been on, uh, especially that helped inform the mission. Um, there was a nice video of you guys going through a, a canopy forest. Mm. Uh, you visit a couple of museums. And then... Your car got stuck on the beach and you had to get towed off the beach. Yeah. And that yeah. was that was an unexpected moment and one of my favorite moments from your video. <laughs> and, and this goes back to what you were saying earlier. I think that um, a, an element of authenticity and unexpectedness within stories. I, and again, these, these videos are basically home movies in a lot of ways. And, and my, my grandfather was big on home movies and uh, my mom has lots of stories about him setting up the projector and running his his super 8 film for for the for the family to watch begrudgingly and i think that's somehow made its way through the through the dna into into my blood cuz i really enjoy it but um yeah 
I really enjoyed that too. And and I feel like the more you expose parts of your um, your own story and bring yourself to these films and these little videos, then yeah, there's, there's a there's a warmness to them. There's a warmth, I suppose, that's more human than sort of stepping back and being removed from it. So I think from my point of view, that's how this content is different from what I would produce commercially. There's a there's a side that there's a side that um, involves us as people. This is so much more effective than anything we could make commercially. However, and if you could make this for resorts, for cities, etc., that you know, there's got to be hiccups in the story. It's got to be authentic because this is the way it's going to be. You know. Yeah, and you, you're quite right. L- like it or not, there needs to be. You need to bring a sense of adventure when you travel with a reduced mobility. Nothing is ever going to go as planned and you need a, a level of res- resilience, which I think a lot of people with disabilities have, but maybe don't get a chance to exercise. There is a, a temptation to kind of um, Netflix and Nespresso and chill at home and make excuses to not go out. And I'm not talking about Egypt or Tel Aviv or New Zealand. I'm talking about go around your block or go around your um, suburb. You know, you can have one or two, no, actually you can have one uh, bad experience and that can scar you, right? You can, if you're, if you're in a wheelchair and you, you're, you feel uncomfortable because you can't get somewhere or there's a step, this can be, this can be really uh, disarming and that can have an effect on you traveling at all. I remember I had a time um, when I went, I went to Berlin and traveled on my own in, in my wheelchair. And I had organized a place to stay, a beautiful apartment. It was a converted brewery in, in uh, Kreuzberg, really hip, cool sort of area. I was very much looking forward to it. Uh, I spent about eight, 24 hours getting there and I arrived and the, the gentleman with the keys took me up the uh, lift to the apartment and there was a, a huge step to get into the apartment. It would have been close to, you know, three quarters of a foot high. And uh-huh. he said to me, and he and he grabbed the handles on the back of my wheelchair and hooked me up onto the um onto the wooden floorboards and said, "Look, there's a guy coming tomorrow. He's the maintenance man, and he's going to make your ramp for for this step. So just stay here until tomorrow. I've put a couple of beers in the fridge, but um just just stay here and and you'll be able to get out tomorrow. So, and I was just dumbfounded. I I was absolutely gobsmacked. Usually accessibility is about not being able to get into a place. And right. I, I, this was the inverse. I wasn't able to get out of the place. Heaven knows what the fire brigade or the, you know, the local, um, you know, emergency services would, would have had to say about that situation. But I was, I, I went from just dismay to, to pure anger. I was like, how could huh. this happen? How could this happen? You know, I supplied all of the information. I gave them everything to ensure this would not happen. So. That's that was a bit of a crucible moment, I suppose. You know, I didn't want this happening to other people. I, I managed okay. Um, I I did drink the beers. I did watch TV. I did work out how the washing machine worked, and you know, go through all of the drawers and you know, explore my space. Um, and you know, true to his promise, of, you know, I heard the, the banging of of timber and nails at about you know seven o'clock in the morning. So my ramp was built, but. That's not the kind of experience that anybody wants, really. No, no. Not sure if I answered your question there. Yes, you absolutely answered my question. And these things probably happen all the time, and they're probably fairly dispiriting. And so it is a, I mean, it's such an honorable mission. I keep saying things like that. But like in life, you're always just looking for something. When you're in marketing, you're not exactly saving whales, all right? So you're going to need to find a way to be useful. And I always struggle with that. And so the idea that you had come across this was just very inviting, and I'm really happy to hear about it. Oh, terrific, mate. Thank you very much. So it's been lovely chatting to you. And, and again, it's about getting that balance right, as you know, the, the form and the content. So let's try and make something useful that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So is, is there a website URL we should send people to where they can uh, take a look? Absolutely. Um, please check out freewheelweekends.com.au, which is a, a showcase that you can uh, have a little look around and um, yeah, see what's on offer there. 
And then you also have content on Instagram and YouTube under Free Will Weekends. Free Will Weekends. That's, that's right. All right. Well, it was really nice to check in with you. You too, Tim. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. I meant to talk to you actually about these, um, these boats that I was on. Part of my little experiment was um, a little Hansa sailing boat. Do you know what a Hansa is? How do you spell that? H-A-N-S-A. It was my first time sailing. Uh-huh. It was a beautiful, beautiful little boat and a lot of fun. And I thought of you. I thought, wow, yeah. Tim would be into this. Yeah. So I, I, I discovered later it's, it's actually a legitimate class of boating. And then uh-huh. there are, there are world championships of this single person boat with a generally one sail. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. A lot of fun. How did you feel on the boat? Did you feel insecure or energized? A combination of both. I think one sort of evolved into the other. Yeah. I was lucky. I was sailing um, down here. There's a, a local lake, which is the one that the Grand Prix races around. Mm-hmm. And it's only about a meter deep. Probably you have your feet touch the floor anyways. The, yeah. The, anyway, so, there was, yeah. you know, and, and there's obviously the safety um, requirements that you mm-hmm. wear a jacket and there's, there's people keep an eye, uh, keeping an eye on you. So not overly uh fearful of my life although i did manage to put a lot of water in that boat absolutely yeah. yeah that's what the boat's for fill it with water <laughs> bail it out do it again knock it down get out there and move the boat around yeah sa- sailing is one of my all-time favorite things to do and like i like to load up a boat and disappear for a few days and cruise around and figure out how to work the wind and the tides and the current and you know, because at the end of the day, you've really earned a good night's sleep. And it's a wonderful thing. And I sleep so well <laughs> on a boat. Um, so did you document your day or your uh, your sailing adventures? I did. Yes. There yeah. was, there's a guy I know who's been up the Inside Passage a handful of times. His name's Chris Cunningham. Uh, he, he works for Wooden Boat Magazine. And he once told me that when you're out on a trip, you can either experience something or you can document it but you can't go either way like you can't just you can't do it halfway so i true. so i don't document a lot of things out on the boat because i just want to go out and experience it i want every second of it that i get yeah Uh, i can understand that but i do i do i have been through some experiences that were great stories that were formative moments that just frightened me or i saw beautiful things or something occurred and i thought to myself well, that's a thing. I guess that can happen. You know, like, like the first time I had waves come over both sides of the boat at the same time. And I thought to myself, I wasn't scared. I just thought, well, that's a thing. I'll watch out for that in the future. It never even occurred to me. I just figured it would just come washing over one side or behind me or something, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and I think sailing's one of those things where you just open yourself up to, to things, to possibilities. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't, you don't know where the wind's going to blow. You sort of have this, or the currents are going to take you. You, you, you hand yourself to nature. And you say, "Okay, let's well, have some fun." Well, yeah, <laughs> we don't quite do that. Yeah, <laughs> there's this great, there's this like great uh, Irish phrase about the idea that when we're careful, we get drowned less. <laughs> it's, it's the idea that like we go out every day, and sometimes things happen, but if we're careful, better chance we come back. Which actually kind of aligns with free well weekends and the idea that we're going to give some information, better chance everybody has a nice time and comes on back, you know? Hey, there we go. I like it. One of my favorite um, quotes actually has to do with a ship. A ship is safe in harbor, but that's not what ships are made for. Correct. Yeah. And the idea of owning an agency, you're going to send a lot of ships to sea and eventually your ship will come back. <laughs> okay, Ryan, <laughs> it was nice to chat with you. Um, let's schedule another time and check in, you know, if, uh, if you're doing work up in Michigan, maybe that means you should do some work in Seattle. Hey, that sounds, that sounds like a great invitation. I'd love to check in again with you, mate. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. All right. Well, have a great day. All right. Take care. Thanks. Input Doc is produced by Megan O'Neill, edited by Lily Chu. The music you're listening to is an original creation by our very own Brian Leahy. We'd also like to thank our project manager, Scott Greger who does all the work at the agency while we make this podcast. I'm your host, Tim Yaden. Have a great day. <laughs>